Thanks, Kevin, and it's great to be back. This is a much nicer venue than it was last time. But uh, just as just uh, as quality a crowd, so really pleased to be with you today. I want to start by just telling you that a lot of what I'm going to say today is in a book I wrote called Yellow Balloons. You can get a free download on it at yellowballoons.net. Uh, we've given away over 22,000 downloads, so really happy about that. Um, and you can also sign up for a daily devotional that a team of us do. That's uh, all about the incredible power that's involved with uh, focusing and good stewardship on the things we can control. We tend to obsess on things we can't control as humans. And so that's kind of the theme of the devotional, but we do a Bible verse and a thought, and you can spend a minute on it or you can chew on it all day. We have about 4,000 people following that. Yellow Balloons devotional is great. Yellowballoons.net, you can get them both. More importantly, I've just given you an excuse to uh, pull out your phone at any time during the talk, and everybody will think you're being spiritual and downloading stuff. You can be reading ESPN or whatever else you want to do if you get, find this boring. So that's, uh, that's a good out for you. Well, today I'm going to talk about a couple of things that everybody uh, deals with, but most of us don't think about it that much. And it's the difference between acceptance and approval. Now, as humans, we all have to have acceptance. It's absolutely a necessity. There's no, there's no choosing whether we want to seek it or not. We must have it. And what all of us crave is unconditional acceptance. What most of us live with is conditional acceptance. And, that, and we tend to strive to gain it, often not even knowing that's what we're doing. But really, acceptance and approval are totally different things. And when we conflate them, it tends to mess us up. So that's the main takeaway I'm going to uh, hope to leave you with today. And I'm going to tell you about my story about how I came to really embrace the difference between the two and the power that it's had in my life. But also, I want you to hope, or I hope you take away that uh, while acceptance is something God grants totally unconditionally, Approval is something he only gives us if we do things that are good for us. He doesn't approve self-destructive behavior. Uh, there's no kind of participation trophy approach that God uses where all behavior is acceptable. It's very clear God wants us to do some things that lead to life and not do things that lead to death. But that's up to us. He's left it up to us. The approval is completely unconditional. And what's really good for us is to walk in the Spirit. And that has a whole lot of uh, ramifications, but walking in the Spirit is not a, 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 a ethereal kind of a concept. It's real tangible, and I'll talk some more about that, but basically it's doing things that feel bad so that you'll be glad later. That's basically what walking in the Spirit is. We'll talk more about that. So first I just want to talk a little bit about my life story and acceptance and approval. If I was going to tell you my physical life story, I'd, talk off, I'd start off saying I was born in Littlefield, Texas. My mom was 39, my dad was 40, my brothers were 11, 15, and 17, so I more or less grew up as an only child. And then I would talk about moving to Big Spring and growing up and playing basketball and going to Texas Tech. And somewhere in there I would have some sort of struggles that I mounted and then something that good that happened, so it would be an interesting story. But if I stood up here to tell you my life story, and after I told you I was born in Littlefield and my mom was 39, my dad was 40, I got a birth certificate, and then later in life I got a social security number and that stood in for my birth certificate. And I started telling you all the different ways I'd use my birth certificate and all the different ways I'd use my social security number. And then one day I needed my actual birth certificate and I couldn't find it. So I went into a deep despair because I didn't know where my birth certificate was. And then I went to the county and got a certified copy and I had it again. And that's all I talked about for the whole time was that I was born. You'd go home and ask your wife or talk to your wife and then she'd say, what did the guy talk about today? And you'd say, it's kind of weird. All he talked about was being born. And I'm not really sure he's confident he is born. Well, you would think that was strange if it was the story of my life, but it's a pretty common 
spiritual testimony. We talk about just being born and not about living. Well, there's a good reason for that and a bad reason for that. The good reason is that our second birth is a resurrection of sorts. And it's taking something that's broken and making it whole, taking something that's crooked and making it straight. It's a transformation. And so, you know, it shows the power of God, the second birth. And so it's worth some focus on. But the other reason's a bad reason. I think Christianity has kind of forgotten that Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And too often we've just gotten stuck with trying to birth as many babies as possible and we're not spending time raising them. The Great Commission is, the operative verb is make. Make disciples. As you go, make disciples. So learning and growing is an integral part of what we're going to do. So that's what I'm going to focus on today as I'm going to focus on choosing life. Now, being born is an important thing. Uh, and the way we're born in this life, in spiritual birth, is completely through grace. It's completely uh, something that's given to us. We all know probably John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believed might, have, might perish but have everlasting life. But I think we get kind of mixed up often on what that really means. And the two verses prior to it tell us exactly what it means. It says this, John 3, 14 and 15, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus says, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross, just like this snake was lifted up on a pole. Now, that story comes from Numbers. And it, was, it, it occurred when the children of Israel were bitten by snakes. And they were going to die. And God told Aaron, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it says here, and it shall be that everyone who's bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. Everyone who's bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So these people had poison in their bodies. And if they just had enough faith to look, hoping they'd be healed, they would be. Pretty cool, huh? Well, Jesus takes that story and he says, I'm just like this. He's speaking to a Jewish audience. They would have completely understood what he's saying. If you have enough faith to look, hoping in me for healing, that's good enough. And that's amazing news. Because the human race is all affected with a snake venom. It's called sin. And we're all condemned to death. And all it takes is enough faith to look hoping for healing, and we're born again. And nothing to do with anything we ever have done or ever will do. It can't be earned and it can't be lost. It's an amazing story. It's unconditional acceptance. But now that we have this power, we have tremendous responsibility. Well, I didn't really understand that growing up. What I understood was that I was born again, and I've been born again as long as I can remember. I grew up in a household with a mom whose hobby was reading and the Bible and praying, and I just never knew anything different. But I thought that uh, I needed to behave in order to have God continue to accept me. And what that inevitably led to was me being judgmental. Now, there's two kinds of judgmentalism in the Bible. There's the older son and the younger son type of judgmentalism. I'm an older son. So my judgmentalism is, you wanton sinner, you do all these things on this list, you must be condemned because I'm okay. And the younger brother sinner, or uh, sorry, judgmentalism is, you hypocrite, you churchgoer, you think you're better than me, but you do the same kind of things I do, uh, at least I'm honest with myself, and you're condemned, and I'm okay. And the whole human race kind of falls into one of those two. Some of us oscillate between the two. But I was a, I was a judgmental person. I am a judgmental person, I'll, I'll say. Uh, so I came to the point of really understanding the difference between uh, acceptance and approval when I came to realize who I really am. And that didn't really happen until I was in my early 40s. Now, 
I um, didn't have many much in the way of marketable skills as a as a well, I don't I don't have any many natural talents I can't really build anything and I'm, I'm not that athletic but there was one thing I was really good at when I was growing up playing Monopoly I was awesome at it <laughs> and so uh, I got the chance to go visit a guy I was thinking about going into engineering because there was, weren't many other things that I, you know, I was pretty good at science and math not many other things I could do and a friend of mine uh, ha got an appointment with me and another guy to go see her dad, who was the president of Cosden Refinery at the time. So we went in this building. It was the only office building in town with an elevator. And we went in his office. It seemed like it was about the size of this room to me in my memory. And he was on a speakerphone, which I'd never seen before. It was like uh, something out of space age. And he was talking to somebody about millions of barrels of oil and all that stuff. And I thought, he's playing Monopoly. So that's what I want to do. That's me right there. I want to be in that chair doing that. So I went and got a chemical engineering degree because that's what he had. And I had one, when you have one data point, it's real easy to make an extrapolation. <laughs> so I had that one data point, And the worst four years of my life was getting a chemical engineering degree. I hated every minute of it. It was the most miserable thing I've ever done. Uh, I don't like to study. I don't like to, uh, I don't like to sit still. And it was horrible. But I wanted to play Monopoly for a living. So then I went to work at Exxon so I could be president of Exxon. And it only took me about a year to figure out that was never going to happen. Everybody around me was the smartest, but way smarter than I was. And I wasn't willing to, to wait 20 years. So I found out you could go into banking as an engineer. And so I, I went into banking to do uh, oil and gas lending. And I got to play Monopoly as an you know, entry level person. Because that, and that was fun. That was really great. And I was really good at it. And I became an executive when I was 27. I moved out here in Midland to be the head of the oil and gas department at a ripe old age of 27. And of course, you know, that was 1983. It was, I moved to here in the month that First National Bank failed. And so I got to learn, I got a PhD in what not to do in the oil business uh, by kind of standing on the, the tattered ruins of uh, the excesses of the 80s. Well, uh, I went then went to work at Parker and Parsley, which is now Pioneer, and we went from being a, like a $50 million company to a billion dollar company while I was there. It was a great run. It was a fantastic experience. And then I left, and I, was, I had a, a, uh, a little grub stake and some income, so I had kind of my life dream of uh, starting my own company, which was fantastic. But on the way out, there was some messiness and I got some criticism. And it was n nothing I hadn't heard before, but some of it, for the first time, really stuck. And the, the crux of the criticism was that I had misunderstood what my personality profile was. That turns out my true personality profile is a J-E-R-K. That's my true personality <laughs> profile. Now, uh, when they look for CEOs these days, one of the things they look for is arrogance, which is kind of shocking. But arrogance, what arrogance is, it's someone who has a natural talent for being determined and decisive and turn it towards selfish ambition. That's all, that's all arrogance is. And I had a lot of arrogance. Now, I still seek to be decisive and to be determined. I still seek to do that. But I try now not to do it with selfish ambition, but with godly ambition. That's my goal. That's what walking in the Spirit's all about. I didn't really get the difference between the two, I don't think, at the time. And my top value is integrity. So I felt like I had been a fraud and a complete failure. So I'm starting my business, kind of, you know, got my life dream is happening, and Pretty much everything was about as good as it could be, and I'm in depression because I've, because I've just kind of been tattered. And I knew this verse uh, from Romans 7, I find therefore there's nothing good dwelling in me that is in my flesh. I had learned that verse, but I never really had personalized it. So I was in a lot of pain, and I was going through the scriptures looking for answers, and I came to the book of Job. And this is where I really had my turnaround was in this book. This is, not a, this is not a theoretical book for me. It's a very personal book. And Job, I think, is one of my, my great heroes and good friends. 
So I really came to understand Job in a very personal way. So I'm going to kind of explain to you what, how I personalize this story so that you can understand the point that I got at the end and what a pivotal thing that was for me. So here's Job's story as I understand it. So Job was an ancient billionaire. He was a trucking mag magnet. He had all these camels, some ancient trucking. Uh, and he was, tra tra he was banking and trade because that's what you did with camels is trade. He was uh, owned Uber, which was, uh, you know, donkeys. That's what they used him for is transportation. He had massive farms, oil and gas, uh, uh, not oil and gas. He had basic farm and agriculture. Uh, he had all these yeah, oxen and all this uh, sort of thing. So he was an ancient billionaire, the greatest man of the East is what it says. And he was also the wisest man. When they had a problem, they brought it to Job to get his advice. And so you get this opening scene in heaven, and God is talking to Satan. And he, he calls Satan over. He says, hey, Satan, come over here. Satan comes over and he says, where you been? Well, I've been wandering around on the earth. Well, what you been doing down there? Oh, you know, just looking around. Have you noticed Job? You think you're trying to make everybody bad, and he's making you fail so horribly. You are losing because Job is so awesome. And Satan says, well, Job is not righteous and awesome like you're saying. He's just shrewd. You give him what he wants, he gives you what you want. What's, that's just a trade. What's, what's a big deal about that? So God says, I tell you what, you take away everything, just don't hurt him, and then let's see what happens. So Satan goes chuckling away, and uh, because he had told him, I can't, I can't do anything to him, you put a protection around him. He said, well, I'll remove the protection for a while. So he goes and he sets it up where Job basically loses all of his business interests and his children all at once. No, no question this is supernatural. And Job's reaction is, the Lord gave, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So Satan comes back, and, and God calls him. Hey, Satan, come over here. Yeah, yeah, what are you up to? By the way, it's interesting, Satan can go to and fro to heaven, right? He doesn't actually get thrown out until Revelation, interestingly enough. So uh, he comes in, he says, where have you been? Well, I've been wandering around. Well, did you see Job? All who maintains his integrity, still making you look bad, even though you incited me to ruin him, even though he had done any, nothing wrong. So God takes full responsibility for the damage, even though Satan's the one that did it, because he removed the hedge. And Satan says, well, 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 yeah, I mean, but you wouldn't let me touch him, so it's not really a full trial yet. He said, well, okay, go ahead and afflict him, just don't kill him. So now Job ends up with boils, and how could it get any worse, right? But what the Bible says is, in all of this, Job did not sin. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? So chap, the, most of the book is he has three friends that come and try to advise him through this. And they're real friends. They sit for seven days without saying a word, and they don't say anything until Job talks. Would you do that? I mean, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty dedicated friendship. And it's consistent with the culture at that time. So then Job starts to talk, and they have this extended conversation. And in the extended conversation, uh, it boils down to this. The three friends say, Job, you must have done something bad. You must have. If you'll just confess that, God will put you back where you were. And Job says, I can't confess to something I didn't do. I'm a man of integrity. I hadn't done anything wrong, so I can't do that. That's basically what they say back and forth. When you get to the end, here's what God says about the three friends. He tells Job, he says, I want you to go and sacrifice for these guys. If you'll sacrifice for these guys, I won't afflict them. I'm going to let them pass because they have not spoken rightly of me like you have. And then he says it again. Kind of like he's getting worked up. Like, they have not spoken right me of me like you have. So I'm going to accept your forgiveness. And what was it that those guys were saying? They were saying, it's just a business transaction. You give God what he wants, he'll give you what you want. Same thing Satan said. So here you have Job who did nothing wrong, crushed. 
Eliphaz and his three friends that spoke wrongly about God totally let off the hook. Exactly the opposite of what Satan claimed. Wow. Unbelievable. So why would God do this to Job, his favorite guy? The guy that is making him win over Satan. Why? Why would he do that? Well, you get to the end, and it says, Job says, oh, well, Job did do one thing. He said, I wish I had, could have a meeting with God, because if I did, then I would be able to explain my circumstances and my perspective, which God's clearly missing, and then God would fix all this. So God comes down, and he says, hey, you wanted a meeting? I'm going to give it to you. But I'm going to ask you some questions first. Uh, where were you when I designed the universe? Uh, tell me how light operates. Tell me how uh, biology works. How did, I, how did I come up with it? How does it operate? And he goes through all of nature. And at the end, Job says, look, I thought I understood you, but now that I see you, I repent, and I look at myself and say, I'm vile. Well, so it's fascinating that God... Uh, clearly, Job's his favorite guy. He crushes him. Job wins. Job totally passes the test, but he's got this one thing left, which is to know God, to see God, who God really is. So, I got it. Pain is something God uses in our lives so that we can know him. And that's what Job got out of that. It's pretty amazing. But what God, the way God got to see God, I'm sorry, the way Job got to see God who he was by seeing himself in contrast. He was the richest guy. He was the wisest person. He was the most righteous guy. He really was. And yet, when he saw himself with respect to God, he said, I'm vile. Self-awareness, that's what Job got. Unbelievable. Well, that's the way I felt. I realized that this verse, there's nothing good dwelling me that in my, is in my flesh, was real. I am a J-E-R-K. I'm an arrogant person. And I'm not getting better. I had this illusion that I was getting better. And I realized the flesh never reforms. It just keeps getting worse. That's why the Bible says crucify it daily. It doesn't say get it, go through self-improvement. There is no self-improvement for the flesh. It's rotten. It always will be. That's why we get to leave it behind when we leave this body. It, that's, that's what we look forward to. So I just, I just basically took responsibility for my flesh. It's me. Uh, I don't have to listen to it, but it's me. So what I learned to do was talk to my flesh like it's a wolf that wants to eat me. I kind of have this, everybody has self-talk. And I learned that there was voices inside of me. I had the flesh and I had a spirit. And the flesh is telling me to do things that are bad for me, and the Spirit's telling me they're good things that are good for me. So what I've learned, basically, is that walking in the Spirit is doing things that always feel bad, and then I'm glad later. And walking in the flesh always feels good, and then I always regret it. And that's basically the bottom line. I mean, think about it. What is walking in the Spirit? It's being patient. By definition, you're not being patient if you're not annoyed. And it's annoying to be annoyed. And it doesn't feel good to be annoyed. Nobody ever walks into a massage parlor and says, look at all these patient people here. Now, they're laying down still like that because it feels good. But being still when you're being annoyed, not reacting, not responding, not, not taking things into bitterness, that's not fun. There's no, there's no uh, joy in that in the short run. The flesh, on the other hand, retaliation feels great. Don't you know that guy this year that took his helmet off and started beating one of the other players with it? Didn't, don't you know that felt good? He really regretted it. It may end his career, right? So that's, that's a pretty good picture of the flesh versus the spirit. And I just kind of learned that. Just, it's never getting any better. It's me. But then I, I, I kind of had another question which was God okay your favorite guy and you smashed him like this so he could know you so what, what am I supposed to learn from that am I supposed to learn don't ever be God's favorite guy be Avis be number two you know try to try to just kind of keep keep your head down 
Is that, is that the main thing you learn? And why don't you just let us go to heaven and sign up for Knowing God 101? You know, why, why can't we just wait till we get there? And I ran across this verse in Ephesians. Ephesians 2.10, and it says, The manifold wisdom of God is revealed by the church to... What do you think it's going to say next? The manifold wisdom of God is revealed by the church, us, to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Job is demonstrating God's righteousness to Satan who's in heaven looking at God with his own two eyes. All the other angels are watching this happen. They're listening to Job and, I'm sorry, God and uh, Satan trash talk each other. And they're watching the drama play out. And what are they learning about? They're learning about God. Well, they've been in God's presence for all these years. They've been through knowing God 101. And this is what I've concluded. There's something about knowing God by faith that's so incredible that God's willing to smash his favorite guy. You know, the Bible tells us there's three great things, faith, hope, and love. And two pass away when we go to the next life. Because you can't believe in what you see. That's not faith. And you can't hope for what you have, because you have it. Love will remain. There's not going to be faith when we know by sight. There's not going to be hope when we are glorified. And I think that some of the weeping and gnashing of teeth type verses apply to believers, because we're going to come to a point in time when we stand before Christ and we give an account for all we've done and we're going to realize what we could have had is gone forever. Now that doesn't mean we're not still happy for the things we do have. Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. We didn't do anything for that. We're in his family unconditionally. But this life is the one and only chance we get to know him by faith. And the rewards of that start now. And they compound forever. That's what I learned. And my life's never been the same. I came to accept my unconditional acceptance. Jesus gave it to me. I don't need to behave in order to live up to it. I don't need to invent a list to compare myself to other people. I don't need to judge anyone else to push them down to lift myself up. I don't need that because it's just been given to me. And I finally came to the point of just receiving it. I'm not, I'm not good enough by comparison. I'm not good enough by any other standard. I just receive it. And that freed me to now live a life where I hope to be approved. And that is not conditional. I'm sorry, it is conditional. It's not unconditional. That is conditional. Because God is a fantastic parent. He's the best coach there is. And no great parent will reject you under any circumstances. But every great parent will only approve that which is good for the child. So, the impact that that's had on me is I constantly have to ask myself, why am I doing this? Am I doing this this interaction with other people? Am I interacting with this child to make me happy or for their best interest? Now, I've got 19 grandchildren now. We don't spoil our grandkids in the way of letting them get away with stuff. We spoil them with time and attention. But we don't want them to be, you know, I mean, they're already sinners enough. We don't want to encourage their you know, sinfulness by encourage disobedience. That's not good for them. It may be convenient for us. It's not good for them as an example. So, you know, that's, that's, um, that's my personalization of that. So that's basically my story. So what's the bottom line? What's the takeaways? And, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good time of discussion.
after this that you can talk about this in your own life because it's one thing to uh, you know hear these words, but the point of it is to apply them. So let me just go through kind of the main takeaways. Number one, walk in the Spirit. So Galatians 5 says, The Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the Spirit. Now lust is not a bad word. We usually associate it with a bad word, but lust means, as a bad thing rather, but lust just means passionate desire. Lust is only bad if we passionately desire the wrong things. The Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the Spirit. And what are they contending for? So this is what the Scripture says. It says, the Spirit lusts against the flesh, and the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and these are in enmity with one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. That's the next statement. So that you do not do the things you wish, which tells us the flesh is the dominant doing. And the spirit is the dominant wishing. And that's why it feels good to do the flesh and then you regret it later. So a really practical way to think about walking in the spirit is a lot of little things that you do every day, all day long, that don't feel good at first. But afterwards, you're really glad you did it. Which allows you to start thinking ahead of, if I do this now, am I going to be sad or happy tomorrow? And now you've got a mindset of living for tomorrow. And what that ultimately turns into is, whose approval am I seeking? Am I seeking the approval of these other people or the one that really matters? My Father in heaven. Because ultimately the most important day of our life is the day we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 says, to receive rewards for deeds done in the flesh, whether good or bad. And that has nothing to do with being accepted because Jesus did all that. The question for us is, what did we do with our lives? And it's going to matter. So, walking in the Spirit. And it gives you a, in Galatians 5, it gives you a kind of a test between the two. If you want to see what walking in the flesh looks like, you get the deeds of the flesh. And there's a list there. And it looks like out of control pleasure seeking, fits of rage, yelling at other people, trying to get your way, controlling behavior, divisions, office politics, stabbing people in the back, gossip, undermining people. In everyday life, all the stuff we see all the time. Survivor, you know, all the things that are glamorized on TV. But if you want to walk in the spirit, it looks like patience, which is annoying. Kindness, which is generally always taken advantage of. Love, which means putting other people's interests above your own, which doesn't feel very good to do. That's what it looks like. And why should I do that? Well, Galatians 6 tells us because you reap what you sow. And if you want to sow bountifully, then plant a lot of seeds. And you plant a lot of seeds by a lot of little decisions, doing things for tomorrow. How I feel tomorrow and how I'm going to feel before I stand before Christ. So that's number one, walking in the Spirit. Number two, acceptance. Acceptance is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace we're saved through faith, and that not a result of works, lest any man should boast. do not have anything to do with anything we have or ever will do. It's just receive. That's how we become a child of God. It can be done at any time. Enough faith to look. And the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, prepared for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has prepared the works, the question is, are we going to walk in them or not? And that's the reward. That's the opportunity. That's what life is set up for us to choose. It has nothing to do with whether we're God's child or not. That's given. It has to do with whether we're going to grow up or remain a baby. And it's the same pattern as in all of Scripture. God gave the promised land to the people. He granted it to Abraham and his descendants. Abraham asked, well, how, how am I going to know this is mine? And God said, I'll tell you how. I'm going to do a blood covenant just with me. Divided some animals in half and went through them in the form of a torch. 
to demonstrate this is just me. I'm going to make sure this land's yours. It's yours forevermore. And then 400 years later, he told his descendants, go in and take it. I've paved the way, but you've got to fight for it. And they said, we're too scared. They said, okay, you go wander in the wilderness, I'll give it to the next generation. And they didn't get it because they didn't fight for it. And walking in the Spirit is something you've got to fight for. The Spirit's lusting against the flesh and the flesh lusting against the Spirit, and they're fighting each other. And if we want to walk in the Spirit, it's fight with the world, with our flesh. But acceptance is freely given. It's our foundation that we can never lose. Approval, that's what we got to fight for. Finally, our opportunity in this life is to know God by faith. It's one only chance we ever get. The one and only. And, you know, we can squander it or we can embrace it. Every second, every day, is a once and an existence opportunity that will never come again. It's never too late to start. Every, every morning's new. And one of the greatest parables and the most encouraging parables to me is the parable of the workers. Where Jesus says, a man went at 8 o'clock in the morning, got some workers, and he went back to the labor pool place, 10, and he got some more. He went back at noon and got some more, and he went back at 3 p.m. and got some more, and 5 p.m. came, and he came, brought everybody up and paid them all the same wage. And the guys at 8 said, hey, wait a minute. The guys that came at 3, they only worked two hours, and they got the same pay that we did. And Jesus says, why are you upset? Because I want to be generous to these guys. They were waiting around all day for their chance. Well, you know, the way I take it is, it's never too late to kick it in gear. There's never a place in the Bible to look back with remorse and say, I lost my chance. There's a place to look back in remorse and say, I'm going to learn a lesson and I'm going to kick it in gear today and I'm going to start fighting for the rest of my life. It's never too late to start. So, let's fight. Let's fight to walk in the Spirit, to do those things that are annoying. Be glad because we know it's right. It'll feel good later instead of regret. And we know that's ultimately what life leads to. Let's embrace every moment to know God by faith, which we do by walking in the Spirit. And let's rest in the full acceptance of God. We don't have to compare. We don't have to judge. We don't have to worry. God did all that through Jesus. We can just believe. And let's put all our efforts into seeking His approval because we have His acceptance. If we will then fully embrace that, then as fathers, we can turn around and give our kids the most precious gift they'll ever have. To know that there's not anything they could ever do that would cause us to reject them while simultaneously never approving anything that's not in their best interest. That's good fatherhood. That's a reflection of Jesus. So I'm going to pray for us now, and then we're going to discuss some questions that are around these uh, topics that I've talked about. And this is the really good part. The speech was just the boring part. You, what you're going to really do now is you're going to have a chance to ingest these things for yourself in your own walk. And uh, I'm looking forward to this part. This is where I think the rubber meets the road. God, I pray that your blessings on everybody in this room. I thank you for their attentiveness. And I pray now that as they begin to discuss these uh, opportunities, that you'll give them a supernatural insight and encouragement. We all mess up. Every one of us is messed up. We all, like sheep, go astray. And I pray, Lord, that we can put, learn from those things, put them behind us. And today, starting today, we can make a better path forward by recognizing who we really are, what our, what our flesh really is, and this amazing resurrection power you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you'll unleash your resurrection power in every man in this room that by your spirit they'll begin to walk in a way that's not explainable in any other way other than through you. And Lord, I know many of these guys are already doing this. And I pray that you'd just give them uh, additional awareness of how great it is when they walk in the spirit and how lasting and how they're laying up treasure as they do it. 
and give them encouragement and enthusiasm to embrace life because this is the way to get our completest fulfillment of our, li of our opportunity here on th this brief time that we call life on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go to your discussions now. Thank you.